All right, hello everyone and welcome to this month's capacity building webinar. We are going to be talking about how to open the window of opportunity for our partner families today. Uh, the 2013 capacity building webinar series, just one more month and then we'll have to change the year on here, but um, it is a monthly web conference hosted by Habitat Minnesota for affiliates. Um, when I started a year ago, this is April Reardon, by the way, your capacity building director, but we were offering lots of different networking phone calls and it was a lot to manage and decided to streamline into a web conferencing series. So rotating topics, able to offer things in a timely fashion. Uh, and it's a nice way to gather our affiliates together on a more regular basis without having everyone need to travel. So um, it's really meant to be a conversation and an, and an opportunity to network and share ideas. So please jump in at any time with your questions or comments. Um, but these tend to be most useful and most, uh, most fun if you do take advantage of sharing your ideas. So uh, these happen monthly. Our next topic in December will be uh, talking about the Dodd-Frank Act and, and implications for mortgage procedures and regulations. So um, many of you have already gotten some information about that, but we'll want to make sure we have, we should really have everybody, all of our affiliates signed up for that one. That'll be really important. And we have Frankie Berger from Habitat International joining us for that. You see on the bottom of the slide there that you will receive slides and other resources via email after the web conference. So you will get a copy of the slides, any other resources that you see, which there's a ton of them built in here. Um, these guys have, have worked really hard and have some great stuff to share with you. So in order to participate, so we really want to hear your questions and comments. Um, there's a couple different ways that you're able to do that. Um, everyone right now is muted for sound. Um, so we, we try to keep everybody muted so we can keep minimize the background noise. But there's a little icon that you can press that has a hand on it. And if you click on that, it will raise your hand. And then I'll know that you are interested in talking with us. Um, in order to talk with us, you can be participating by phone or headset or just a built-in microphone. There's a lot of different ways to do that. You can also type questions into the question panel. It doesn't have to be a question. It can also be a comment. It doesn't automatically broadcast to every all of the other attendees. Um, so I'll look at those and then I can share them. You know, if the presenters start asking everyone to respond to a question and you want to type yours in, then that's where we'll see that and I can share that. So we do have some new people with us today. So I um, wanted to be sure to talk a little bit more about how to participate that way. Um, and I also have just a couple of polls that helps us to know um, how you are planning to participate today. So I'm going to ask that first to let us know what you have ava available. Kind of, Will you be talking to us um, using your phone and also being able to chat or use that question box? Maybe you have a microphone or a headset. And we'll also be typing, you know, if you have no access to audio, you can't, you know, talk to us live that you'll just be typing only. And then maybe I just plan to listen and I can't do um, talking or chatting. So just to let us know how you are planning to participate, because that really helps us a lot. It looks like for my end of things, everybody has equipment or the ability to talk with us, but According to the poll results so far, very few of you are interested in talking with us. So maybe you'll become more brave as we go along. So most of you are just thinking of you'll be able to chat. There's a big chunk who are just listening only and um, a small group who might be willing to talk with us. So um, I encourage you to try to, if you're in the listening only, maybe just move into the I'll, I'll type and I'll chat. And, and participate that way. You'll get a lot more out of it just by um, being more interactive. If you're in this chat only and you have access to a headset or a microphone, maybe try to move into this. Um, maybe I would raise my hand and talk with you. Okay. Um, 
get those slides back up there. And I will introduce without any further ado. Oh, there's one more question, one more poll question that I have for you guys. Um, sometimes people have more than one person gathered around their computer. And so for attendance purposes and tracking how many people participate in our webinars, it would be helpful to know how many people are participating with you today. So if you can respond to that quickly, that would be great. All right, we're almost there. Great. So we have um, a couple people who have, or quite a few people who have more than one person with them. Most of you are participating alone, but that's great to know. Thank you very much. And so we have two fantastic VISTAs who have worked really hard to uh, put this webinar together. They have a ton of information to share with you. Uh, first off, we have our very own Habitat for Humanity Family Services VISTA here at Habitat Minnesota, Erin Kaniski. Erin uh, uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota with a Spanish and Urban Studies degree. Among his, uh, he's got an incredible amount of experience in, in that short career, but um, includes some, some work with the City of Lakes Community Land Trust, Twin Cities Community Land Bank. He's got a really good grasp of what's going on with affordable housing and a lot of passion for that. And so what Aaron will be sharing with us and just in his first quarter as a Family Services Vista has already completed a family selection needs assessment and has been interviewing many of you. I'm sure lots of you have already talked with Aaron. So we're glad to have him with us. And he is joined by our fantastic Douglas County Habitat for Humanity Family Services Vista. So Zach graduated from the University of North Dakota in 2011. He had a bachelor's in political science. He has years of experience volunteering and working with nonprofit organizations, including Habitat, Conservation Corps, and several service organizations in college. Uh, since starting with the Douglas County affiliate, Zach has created and implemented several policies and selection strategies in their family services area. And what Aaron learned in interviewing Zach is just that some of these resources that he's created are really have really been effective. And for the first time in the affiliate's history, there are three of four families approved for the 2014 build season thus far. So he's had a lot of impact. So Aaron's going to share some of what he's learned just from interviewing all of you. And then Zach has some great tools and strategies to share with you as well. So I'm going to hand it over to those guys and I will though be checking out and looking for um, all of your questions and comments. Thank you so much, Aaron and Zach. Yeah, thanks, April. All right, thank you, April. All right, so to start off today, um, myself and Zach, as part of our work plans, we've uh, read through the Family Selection Operating Manual. So we wanted to ask um, those of you listening in today a couple of questions about some of the some of its content. So we know that not all of you have had time to read the 300 plus pages, so we figured today would be a great time to share some of that knowledge with you. Yeah. So the first question we have for you is how does HFHI define long-term debt? Is it debt that takes more than A, six months, B, 10 months, C, 12 months, or D, 18 months to pay off? So if you want to write in your answer to April, we'll give you a little bit to think about that. And so what is the importance of long-term debt? Um, it does play a role in determining a, an applicant's ability to pay. So depending on how you um, define long-term debt, they may have more or less long-term debt than they actually do. So Britta was the first one in, uh, and she guessed, or knew, I, I don't want to suggest guess, but she says B, We've got a couple others, Goldie and Kathy, with the answer D. So you're going to tell us what's correct. So the correct answer would be... That's somewhat of a slow computer <laughs> here. So. 10 months. Um, so this is what HFHI um, recommends as considering uh, long-term debt. So. 
What does this mean? Debts that will be paid off in less than 10 months do not necessarily need to be included um, in calculating the applicant's long-term debt. Uh, so our next question here, another thing from the manual. Uh, according to HFHI, applicants with more than what amount in collections should be referred to an outside agency? Uh, so we have A, 1500, B, 5000, C, 1000, or D, 2000. So once again, please chat your answers into April there. And, uh, well, the point of looking at this in the manual is just giving our committees a rigid number to go around so they don't have to just wander each time from applicant to applicant. They can have a number to know what to do with each time. So <laughs> we, have, we have three yeah, answers yeah. submitted. We've got Britta, Sandy, and Jackie with B, D, and C. <laughs> so. Oh, all right. There's some well, uncertainty. We'll the correct answer here. It's actually D, $2,000. So inside of the manual, it says that applicants with more than $2,000 in collection should be referred to an outside agency. And this can also be interpreted as applicants that have more than this amount in collections may be denied by that fact, knowing that they may not have the ability to pay in the future they would have to resolve these collections before. This also leaves the question of what to do with those applicants that still have a dollar amount in collections, but that's below this $2,000 amount. And I will talk a little bit more about some options later on. Well, it's something to be aware of when you are looking at this, is to know that not all credit reports are 100% accurate. So it might be a bad idea to uh, just deny them without verifying with the applicant first, looking at their collections and giving them the opportunity to refute them. So we have a couple additional operating manual highlights we wanted to point out to you today. The first one relates to accepted sources of income in determining an applicant's uh, income eligibility. So the manual uh, states that reliable income should be considered all sources of income that can be projected to continue steadily for the next three years. And the next one we have there is to know that you have 30 days to approve or deny an applicant after you've received a complete application. Now that complete application is up to interpretation, but the one thing to know is that it does state that in the manual that you have to perform a home visit interview to approve an applicant. So your application wouldn't be complete until you have performed a home visit. And this requirement comes from the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Sex offender uh, registry checks are required by HFHI, so hopefully all affiliates have policies in place to uh, perform those. Criminal background checks at the same time um, are recommended by HFHI. And just food for thought, I know not all affiliates uh, do criminal background checks, but it could um, help an affiliate avoid any situations where there is a family member that does have a criminal background, comes to light for some reason, um, even though it wasn't checked during the family selection process. And the last point there is that foreclosures are to be treated the same as bankruptcies. And we see in the manual that bankruptcies, the applicant shouldn't have had a bankruptcy within the last two to seven years. And at our affiliate in Douglas County, we went ahead and defined that in policy and said three years instead of leaving that gap so wide open. We did some research with other affiliates and other organizations and found that three years was a good number to use. All right, so as April touched on earlier, I will be sharing the main highlights from the Family Selection UFTA report uh, with you today. And the actual report will be sent out, I believe, uh, following uh, the webinar today. So for the report, I was able to interview with staff or selection committee members from 23 of the 32 Minnesota affiliates. I did my best to reach out to all affiliates. However, some were uh, more available or responsive to my request for an interview. Um, so I will be talking a little bit more about the main barriers highlighted by affiliates, uh, their outreach practices, and give a little bit more detail about the selection process. Uh, that they use. And this information that I'm sharing with you, it's a small part of all the information that I've gathered so far, but it is 
what we know. And as I said, we want to highlight the main trends uh, affecting family selection for you. So by far, the greatest barrier indicated by affiliates uh, would be debt and credit issues. I believe almost 90% of affiliates that I talked with explicitly identified it as um, a top barrier. Um, and this was followed by narrow income limits. Um, both of these have to, to do with an applicant's ability to pay. Um, at the same time, however, there are other barriers outside of an applicant's ability to pay that were identified, and these include um, community visibility, or perception of habitat, uh, their outreach practices, and the efforts made to structure the selection committee and develop consistent policies and procedures. Other issues that came up uh, in conversations with affiliates, uh, not explicitly identified as barriers, uh, included incomplete applications and a small number of denied applicants actually reapplying and qualifying for Habitat in the future. This list isn't all inclusive, so if um, those of you listening feel that your affiliate is facing any other barriers um, not listed here, you can feel free uh, to share those uh, with us. You can chat those to April. And what's interesting looking at this, I actually took a look at our uh, denied applicants and looked at the barriers that they faced. And looking at that top one there, debt and credit issues, actually over 65% of our denied applicants in the past two years were denied due to debt and or credit issues. All right. Okay, so here we can see uh, a, the flowchart for a typical family selection process. And I use the word typical because if you look at the specific details of each affiliate selection process, no two are the same. So what I did was highlight in yellow um, the barriers that uh, affiliates identified to show where they can occur within this process. We can see that the majority of them occur uh, before this process ever begins or during the community outreach stage early on. Debt or credit issues as well as income limits are the only barriers identified by affiliates that can occur uh, at multiple stages uh, in the middle of this process, uh, depending on whether or not an affiliate utilizes any uh, sort of pre-screening, meaning uh, formal pre-application or any steps in the process that look at an applicant's income or debt before they are given the full application. Other barriers identified uh, have to do with incomplete applications received as well as uh, the low number of applicants that reapply for Habitat in the future. So starting with the uh, marketing material, um, brochures, flyers, uh, it's important that um, these things have um, good information regarding the, the main um, eligibility requirements, uh, specifically uh, income limits, so that an interested individual who sees it uh, can uh, make an educated um, guess um, on whether or not they would qualify for Habitat. Affiliates utilizing orientation sessions, it's uh, important to keep in mind time or location, because if either one of these two things is inconvenient for an interested individual, they may not be able to attend. Sections of the application or pre-application themselves might not be easily understandable for an interested um, qualified individual to complete it. They might, de uh, might deter them from completing it. While they are completing the application, there might not be enough support to address an applicant's questions or to assist them in completing the application if necessary. There also might not be enough time to complete that application. Applicants have a lot of different things going on that um, may uh, prohibit them from devoting as much time as they would like to uh, to completing the application. In the same vein, there might not be enough time to turn in missing documentation after an incomplete uh, application is uh, received by the affiliate. During the selection committee stage, uh, the selection criteria might not be consistent between the marketing material and the selection criteria that the committee ultimately uses to make its decisions. Finally, um, denied applicants left without adequate support might not know what they need to do in order to um, qualify in the future. 
Yeah, and looking at this too, we've actually uh, had two applicants this year that had applied before in Douglas County and been denied, and uh, they've overcome uh, some of these barriers this year and actually been approved. Uh, we had one applicant that has applied before and actually was denied due to not put bringing in all the necessary documentation in a timely fashion and now had applied again. We worked more closely with them, gave them some more time, and they have been approved. And we have another applicant that has overcome some other barriers as well. All right. Several affiliates indicated ineffective outreach as a major barrier to finding qualified families. So on this slide, we can see all the different outside organizations that affiliates reach out to or partner with uh, to find potential partner families. And as we can see, there's a wide range of different organizations uh, affiliates reach out to. From all these potential referral sources, I was able to identify um, the biggest referral sources for um, Habitat affiliates. The top three by far are word of mouth, uh, social service or CAP agencies, and churches. Specifically with CAP agencies, their Head Start program and energy assistance programs. Um, uh, many affiliates have had success reaching out to those programs. Um, other uh, training referral sources include newspaper and radio, uh, which is a traditional outreach method, but has been successful for several affiliates. In addition, local lenders and employers were identified as well by several affiliates. Um, so these past, uh, the last two, I think, um, affiliates could target more. Local lenders, they see individuals that are already interested in home ownership um, and employers. Uh, if an affiliate is able to target businesses that have employees within their income guidelines, there's a large number of potential referral sources that um, affiliates can uh, tap into. And here's some other referral sources uh, identified by affiliates. From interviews, it seems that m most affiliates don't track where applicants or previous homeowners found out um, about Habitat um, systematically. So a simple thing to do is just to ask, put a question in your uh, application asking that, and that can make your outreach more effective, and you can build upon um, what has already been working for you in addition to uh, seeking uh, new partnerships. Um, I also am working on a collaboration mapping resource so that will help affiliates identify potential collaboration opportunities as well. Um, this, all the organizations on this slide aren't all inclusive so if there are any other partnerships that have been successful uh, for your affiliate, um, feel free uh, to chat those into April. And we at uh, Douglas County have actually implemented uh, asking our applicants where they heard about us and we definitely found that word of mouth was absolutely the number one. Our part current partner families are great for us to get that word out. Uh, another thing that I want to touch on here on this slide is to make sure that with all of these uh, partners that they know your criteria and you know their criteria we absolutely don't want to be putting applicants in a loop of false hope, turning them to other organizations that they won't qualify for either. So the more you know and the more they know, the better. So we highlighted different organizations that affiliates reach out to. Um, here we're focusing on the different ways to outreach uh, to uh, different agencies. Um, and these can include uh, emailing organizations, um, mailing them lender letters, or meeting to talk in person with staff or individuals that utilize an agency's services. So on this slide we can see several examples of different outreach uh, tactics affiliates have used that have been successful for them or that are uh, outside the box that your affiliate could utilize if you don't already. As Zach just mentioned, it's good to make sure uh, to meet and talk with outside agencies so they know what the main eligibility requirements for Habitat is. Um, through doing this, there's a greater chance that if they refer someone to a Habitat affiliate, that person uh, will qualify. It also helps to build a partnership um, with that agency uh, that could help with future collaboration opportunities. Um, so going back to the previous slide, um, 
depending on uh, your outreach methods currently, you may already be outreaching to a majority of these organizations. Um, one thing you should keep in mind is how you are reaching out to these organizations. There might be a more effective way um, to go about doing that. Also keep in mind that there are multiple programs that you can reach out to within a single agency. I mentioned CAP agencies have Head Start programs, energy assistance programs, as well as a number of other programs that you can um, reach out to as well. So one of the most common strategies for addressing credit and debt issues is for affiliates to refer uh, denied applicants to an outside agency for further support. Well, looking at the graph here, we can see that Lutheran Social Services is by far the most utilized outside agency. Um, interesting to note that the second highest number of affiliates I talked to indicated that they don't uh, refer denied applicants to any outside agency. So if uh, you're one of those affiliates, um, look at what agencies other um, affiliates are referring denied applicants to. So the act of referring a denied applicant to an outside agency is helpful for affiliates um, when an applicant uh, actually resolves their issues on their own and reapplies and eventually qualifies. Um, however, um, as of now, uh, most affiliates haven't seen a very high number of applicants doing so. So affiliates need a way that provides greater support and guidance to prepare more denied applicants to qualify for Habitat in the future. Um, one promising practice I want to highlight is Central Minnesota's Action Plan Program, which helps applicants with manageable credit or debt issues resolve these issues within um, a period of three to six months before um, being approved for home ownership. This program is done in-house. Uh, Central Minnesota has a dedicated family services staff person. Um, <clears throat> so your affiliate might be thinking, well, you know, we don't have that level of staff capacity currently. There are several ways um, your affiliate could go about adapting this type of program, Central Minnesota's Action Plan program, to fit the needs of your affiliate. So. Uh, one way would be to recruit volunteers with banking or financial counseling experience. Second, you can train current selection committee members uh, in financial counseling. And these individuals can assist denied applicants um, on a one-time basis, kind of lay out what it is they need to do in order to qualify in the future for Habitat before referring them to an outside agency. Or you could assist them <clears throat> on a more ongoing basis um, which uh, provides greater um, accountability, oversight, and support for that individual to help guide them in the right direction um, towards resolving their issues and qualifying for Habitat in the future. Um, most affiliates will say that um, applicants that resolve their issues on their own and that reapply um, is a great uh, indicator of willingness to partner, and I don't disagree with that. Um, I just think that uh, for some individuals that are referred out, they might just need um, a little more guidance or support. And that's no indication that they aren't able to do it. They just need a little bit more help. So, okay. so as I mentioned before, no two affiliates have the same family selection process. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the ways that they can structure that process differently. So um, a majority of affiliates utilize an open, ongoing application process. Uh, and this is better for affiliates with fewer applicants looking to generate a larger applicant pool. At the same time, it does pose the risk of uh, potential potentially receiving more incomplete applications. The remaining affiliates utilize a defined or closed application process, which can include either a single uh, defined time frame throughout the year or multiple application rounds. And this strategy is better for affiliates with larger applicant pools. Uh, it helps to focus the committee and staff work uh, related to the selection process. At the same time, though, it can potentially limit the number of applications your affiliate receives. Regarding ways affiliates distribute applications, 
HFHI suggests that applicants meet with staff or a committee representative with all necessary documentation in order to complete the application together. Um, no Minnesota affiliate utilizes this strategy, even though it uh, can promote greater efficiency through providing immediate support to applicants and through verifying that the application is uh, completed correctly. So which process to choose? As an affiliate, you need to assess where you are and where you want to be. Um, and what I mean by that is looking at the biggest issues that you see with your current uh, family selection process. Do you have too few applicants, too many, too many incomplete applications, or do you not select your families on time? And then you want to choose which process could best address um, these issues. So I have two uh, affiliate examples here. Um, so in the case of Goodhue County, uh, in the past they utilized a defined application process. As a result, um, they weren't getting the number of applications they were hoping for. So they switched to an open application process, which helped to increase um, or generate a greater applicant pool. Northwoods, on the other hand, they previously used an open application process and it was overwhelming for staff dealing with um, the amount of incomplete applications and time uh, spent requesting documentation from unqualified applicants. So they switched to a defined process which helped to reduce the number of incomplete applications they were receiving. Finally, you want to keep in mind the potential risks associated with each strategy that I mentioned on the previous slide and kind of outweigh uh, the benefits and the negative uh, aspects of it. So pre-screening and orientation sessions are two uh, methods affiliates can use to make their selection process more efficient. However, a majority of affiliates do not utilize either pre-screening or orientation sessions. Pre-screening can streamline the process through identifying families that don't meet basic uh, eligibility requirements earlier in the process. And this helps to reduce the time uh, spent requesting supporting documentation from unqualified applicants. Orientation sessions help to explain the selection process and application itself better, which enables interested individuals to better assess if they are ready to go through the process. So Aaron, this means that 61% of affiliates just have their application and if somebody requests it, they get the full application. Is that, Correct. Is that right? Okay. Okay. Correct. Just want to make sure I and, understood that. Yeah. So the same number of affiliates utilize either uh, pre-screening or orientation sessions, but an affiliate can utilize both at the same time. They can utilize an orientation session and give out a pre-application at that session as well. Um, or use one or the other. Northwoods, I mentioned before switching to a defined application process, they also use a qualification packet that pre-screens individuals for income and debt guidelines before they are given a complete application to fill, uh, to fill out. And uh, using the combination of a defined application process with this qualification packet has really helped to reduce the number of incomplete applications uh, they have received. Another resource that SEC has worked on uh, developing has been uh, the staff checklist that we'll talk a little bit more about. Yeah, so we are one of those affiliates that we don't have an orientation session or a pre-screening application. So one of the things that I've instituted is the staff checklist, and this just helps us to ensure that we have a complete application from the get-go, that we're not tracking down applicants and trying to fill in simple information uh, there signed and date or their um, gross wages instead of net wages and this has definitely helped us out in the in the long run to to save some time. Great, thank you Zach. Um, now I will be turning it over to Zach who will talk more about uh, the work that he's done with Douglas County uh, specifically regarding um, narrow income limits and the work he's done to improve their income guidelines. But first we have a couple more family selection operating manual questions for you. 
Um, so again, um, after you see the question, you can uh, chat in your response to April or you can raise your hand to be called upon. So according to HFHI, applicants should be given A30, B14, C60, or D90 days to turn in missing documentation. And I talked a little bit about this earlier as a potential barrier um, for some qualified applicants. Um, I guess a good way to look at it is they have a lot of different things going on that they can't always um, turn in missing documentation as quickly as they'd like to or as quickly as the affiliate would like them to. Okay, it looks like we have three responses that say B and one that says A. Um, thanks, Sandy, Carly, and Goldie. So it looks like it's good that uh, we've taken the time to... Oh, we now uh, we have a guess have... for C also. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There's lots of voters right now. All right. I'll show you the correct answer here. So HFHI recommends giving applicants uh, 60 days to turn in missing uh, documentation. And giving applicants more time rather than less to submit missing documentation can help an affiliate uh, generate a better, a greater number of qualified applicants. Um, I have a question too, uh, just about so the pre-screening application that Northwoods uses. Aaron, do you have that, or have they shared that with us? That could be something. I that... do. We'll double I do check. Have that. Yeah, we'll double check with Northwoods. I'm sure that it'll be okay, but then we can send that out with our follow-up materials as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. So one more question there. According to HFHI and HUD, families who pay more than what percentage of their monthly household income are considered to be cost burdened? So this is another piece that shows up over and over again in the family selection manual. And this really helps us in multiple ways to determine if a family has the need, uh, judging by their, their current housing situation, if they are cost burdened, and also we can utilize this to ensure that the family qualifies for their ability to pay uh, to not be cost burdened by our payment. Well, it looks like people know this one. We've got all B. All right, great. So four votes for B. B is the correct answer. And like I said before, 30% uh, should be used as the housing ratio to determine the ability to pay. All right. Well, thanks, Aaron, for your piece. We'll uh, move into some of the things that I've done at the Douglas County Affiliate now. Uh, first, when I arrived at my affiliate, I knew that we had struggled to find qualified applicants over the years. Uh, we had plenty of applications, but we wouldn't always find the most qualified applicants. So naturally, the first thing I did was uh, research the qualification criteria. So like we've talked about, taking a look a lot at that manual, my habitat, find a lot of resources to find uh, the best practices for family selection. And immediately at our affiliate, I found inconsistencies in policies, and manuals, and marketing materials. Uh, for example, some things said we serve families between 50 and 60 percent of the county's median income, and the manual clearly states that it is to be between 25 or 30 uh, percent between that and 60 percent. Um, so there's some inconsistencies there. In any case, I knew that we had a very small window of opportunity, and I wanted to do anything we could to open up the criteria. Uh, in the following slides, I'm going to go over some of the changes I've made and we've made at our affiliate that have had a positive effect on finding qualified applicants. Uh, and for the first time, as you've seen before, in our affiliate's history, we have three out of four families approved for next year's build before even the end of the calendar year. So one of the first things we can do to find more qualified applicants is to verify that their income actually qualifies them. Uh, I've seen over and over again that applicants often don't list their gross income be and because of it can be determined to not qualify. Many of our applicants don't even think in terms of gross and net income. They just know what they bring home on their check because that's what matters to them. And Clear ways to combat this would be to require pay stubs and public assistance statements with the application. 
or you can run verifications of income, uh, sending letters to social services and their employer to verify their incomes. And of course we can do both, require pay stubs as well as send out these verifications. Another thing to think of is when you're working with applicants, always be sure to use the phrase before taxes. I have that highlighted here on the bottom, before taxes instead of gross income. Like I said before, a lot of applicants don't even think this way in terms of gross and net. So to use simpler terms, before taxes is going to help you in the long run. And you may think that this isn't something that your affiliate has time for, that you can't send out these verifications, or that this is asking too much of the applicant. But I always say that if something we can change or do will help just one family, it's worth it. And I actually have an example of how it helps out a family at our affiliate. Uh, Carmen had applied with our affiliate three times before and had been denied each time. Um, as you can see from applying three times, she applied again, so it demonstrates that she's pretty resilient. And uh, just a few weeks after I had started at our affiliate, she came in and I gave her her application, went over the criteria and the process, and sent her on her way to fill that out. I remember a few weeks later we received her application and after initially reviewing it, it seemed imminent that she would be denied again. Uh, the income she listed on her application put her well below the minimum, but after verifying her income with her pay stubs and a letter to her employer, we found that she had just enough income to qualify to be a homeowner with us. <clears throat> after a recommendation from the Family Selection Committee, we presented her case to the board for approval and she qualified. She was approved and she's now going to be a homeowner in 2014. So that's just a great example. Uh, Carmen and her son, they're just one example of what verifying income can do at your affiliate. Uh, like I said before, if it helps out just one family, it is absolutely worth it. So, so, Zach, think, so Zach, was she just listing her net income? She was just listing her take home and not the gross or what was She the... definitely was, yeah. Okay. And that's by far enough to uh, put you yeah. below. So okay. she had, uh, she was just over our minimum and qualified because she had no other debts or anything. So that was a, a phenomenal story for us. So we talked about verifying income and now we'll talk about knowing what your income limits are and what they need to be. So another thing that I've looked at in my first months with my affiliate is just who would qualify. Talking about this window of opportunity. Um, like I mentioned before, I looked over 54 denied applications from the past few years and searched for trends and, barrier, and, bar and barriers for families. I found that over half of the denied applicants were within our income limit of our county. I also looked at exactly what income different families would need to qualify. So I'm going to show you how the income limit of the county doesn't necessarily match up with our income limits. Do you want me to launch the poll? So I would. Okay. Do you want to talk about the question a little bit? And I'll just launch it though. Okay. Yeah. So what I have there, uh, is just talking about what what you feel uh, would be the biggest indicator of the the minimum income for families in in your affiliate. So you can answer there uh, the different options that we have. Uh, would it be the 30% of the county's median income, like I talked about, or would it be house pricing? Uh, some affiliates look at 25% of the county's median income or even the average rental rates. So we're seeing some. So it's kind of like if you had to pick one of these things to be your indicator, which one would it be? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So which one is most going to influence okay. your uh, decision or what your criteria is for your minimum income? Okay, and almost everybody has voted. Let's see here, Let's see if I get one more before I close the poll. All right, I'm gonna close and we'll share. So 36% said 30% of the county's median income. Most of you, the biggest group, 55% said house pricing, pricing and monthly mortgage. 25% uh, the county's median income. Oh, 25% of the county's median income, sorry. And nobody thought average rental rates. 
All right. So here I'll go into showing you that it is, in fact, the house pricing and a monthly mortgage that is the biggest indicator of what your minimum income is going to be. Smart so girl. Yeah. <laughs> so in the following slides, I'll show you just exactly how to uh, calculate that and how this really will simplify your income criteria. So what you see here, at, uh, we've got just a couple or th three different options, but I'm going to highlight the 30-year term. Uh, that's what we use at our affiliate. Um, so I wanted to just show you an easy way to calculate this. So we're looking at our 30-year term uh, turns into 360 payments. Now, at our affiliate, I uh, talked with our executive director and our construction team to determine exactly what the average mortgage total would be for a family in the upcoming year. Found that it was 135,000 at our affiliates, and I, if you'd like to chat in to April, uh, if you know the mortgage total at your affiliate, it would be interesting for Aaron and myself to know as well. But uh, a further calculation on this amount for that payment, we would take 135,000 divided by 360, uh, from which you get 375. That's going to be your monthly principal. But as we all know, that's not the only thing that goes into a mortgage payment. The homeowner is also going to have taxes and insurance. And to calculate this, I simply took an average of all of our current homeowners escrow and uh, what their monthly escrow was. And here we have 225. So 600 is simply derived from adding 375 plus 225 or your principal plus your escrow equaling your total monthly payment. So 600 is the number that we're going to use going forward to help you uh, calculate your minimum income for your affiliate. So you may want to do this process for your affiliate as well to figure out the numbers you're going to work with. So what I have here is uh, showing our housing ratio. So to see if an applicant qualifies to make our payment, we need to ensure that they're not cost burdened by it. So as we said before, HFHI and HUD define a homeowner or renter to be cost burdened if they devote more than 30% of their income to housing expenses. So you can see here that income, house payments, and 30%. If you're coming out of that uh, with less than 30% as a housing ratio, you're determined to be not cost burdened. Uh, and Aaron, I believe that you've seen some other affiliates that actually use lower than 30%, uh, which makes it a little bit tougher for their applicants to qualify. Is that, is that true? That is correct. Uh, in interviews with affiliates, I, I found that several affiliates utilize housing ratio below 30%. I've seen uh, 29, 28, as low as 25 to 26%. Now, it may only be several percentage points, but um, those percentage points could make the ultimate difference between an applicant qualifying or not. And like I said before, if it helps out just one family, it's definitely going to be worth it. So, so far what I've laid out is our uh, house payment, our monthly payment, as well as our uh, housing ratio. So what you see here is the next step in calculating your minimum income. At the top, I have a chart highlighting what would be Douglas County's area median income for a family of four at 63700 uh, This, These numbers, these totals, show us what is at 30% uh, of the county's median income. So like I said before, uh, this is not really going to be your minimum income. We know that a family trying to make a $600 payment a month, if they're only making thirteen or fifteen or even $17,000 a year, it's quite clear that they're not going to be able to afford that and that they're going to be cost burdened. So to determine our monthly uh, minimum, what we're going to do here is uh, take $600, which was our monthly payment, uh, estimated mortgage payment. We're going to divide that by the housing ratio, 30% or 0.3, and then we'll come up with $2,000. So that's quite simple what the minimum amount a family has to make per month uh, to qualify for a Habitat 
home loan. Uh, and we also see here to figure that out for annual income, simply multiply by 12 and we're at 24,000. So this chart up here, we see a much more simplified version down here. Instead of all these different increments, we have a very simple minimum income. For families with one to seven people, it's simply 24,000 per year. That's what they have to make because they can't be cost burdened by our payment. So it doesn't matter what the HUD standards are. What matters is if they can make our payments. So we need to ensure that they have the ability to pay. And what we learned from all of this is that house pricing is truly the biggest influence on your minimum income limit. So at your own affiliate, uh, reference these calculations to go back and figure out what your actual minimum income is. And this is going to help you out with marketing and your selection criteria as well. Did you so have, did you have any, oh sorry. a simple way of showing this. I just had a question about, and this is, I can ask it here yeah. too. Was there any discussion of the minimum income should be more for a bigger family because their ex other expenses would be higher? Yeah, as you saw on the bottom here, that actually does go up. Um, this is just for our affiliate. Their expenses may be higher for uh, eight people, so that's actually utilizing the 30% of the county's median income. And just for this purpose, I didn't want to get into that specifics. I okay. thought this might be complicated enough. Um, <laughs> but you would want to look at your house pricing as reflective of how many people are going to be in the house, your bedrooms and such. And you might have different determinants uh, based upon family size. But as you can probably tell already, that gets a little bit more complicated. But feel Well, free right. To, and a bigger yeah. house would have a, probably have a bigger mortgage. And that yeah, of exactly. Okay. So yeah. feel free to chat with me afterward about that. Uh, here we have just a simplified version of that, you know, whether we have two people, two parents in the home bringing in money into the home and two kids running after them, they still have to make $24,000. Um, even if it's one person bringing in money into the home, a baby, a parent, and four other kids, uh, they still have to make $24,000. They still have to be able to make that payment. And it's still the case even with a a smaller family, just one person bringing in income, and uh, two little kids chasing after them, we're still at 24000 So looking at this, that like what I talked about before with our window of opportunity, it just really shows you how small our window of opportunity for families really is. So anything we can do to open this up and just be aware of it is going to be helpful for you going forward. So what you see here is the minimum income and the maximum income, which is also known as 60% of the county's median income. So you can see that $10,000 window per year is actually quite small, as well as here, a $14,000 window is not all that much. And uh, like I discussed before, we strive to serve from 30 to 60%. And here, if our mortgage is $600 a month, we're really only serving families between 42% and 60%. And that is not nearly as wide of a window as we would like to serve those lower income families if we could. Uh, so this all is based on house pricing. Anything you can do with your house pricing is going to help you. Same thing you see here on uh, four person from 38 to 60, not as open as we would like to see that. So we want to do anything we can to strive to open up the window as wide as possible. So what you see here is just going to give you a goal to strive for. And I've broken down these calculations as well. Sorry to all the people that uh, don't like math. I try to make it fun and put in little bubbles for you at least. So what we have here is uh, between a typical family size of three and four, we have a 30% area median income, uh, annual income of 18000 as we saw on the chart before, it was between 17 for a family of three and 18 for a family, or 19 for a family of four. So I'll simply average that at 18. And then if we try to get our monthly income, we'll just divide that by 12 and come up with 1,500. So you can see that that's much lower than our 2,000 we had established before. So once again, this is a goal to strive for. It's not something you may be able to get to, but it's just knowing these numbers is going to have you uh, help you in the future. Now, our, our monthly income at 
to determine if they're not cost burdened, we would multiply that by 0.3 or 30 percent, and our goal for our monthly payment would be 450. We saw before at 600 uh, for a home at 135,000. So any way you can bring that home cost down, you want to be talking with your construction committee. So this just shows how everything is intertwined. Uh, another simple thing you can do is increase the amount of years that your mortgage goes for. Uh, as we saw before, it was less for a 35-year mortgage as well. So when I talk to uh, other committee members, volunteers uh, that have a decent understanding of qualifications, I mentioned filters. Uh, families making it through filters to qualify. So first an applicant has to make it through the income filter. Does their household income, uh, are they below 60% of the county's median income? And if yes, they have made it through that, in, that filter, they are below 60%, we will look at their housing ratio and ensure that they can make it through that as well. So are they not cost burdened by our payment? Are they under 30% of the ratio? Uh, then on to the next one that we won't discuss too much, but I just wanted to mention it. We want to make sure that they're not cost burdened by their debts as well, so they would have to make it through that filter. Uh, we would look that they don't have significant debts that would make them too cost burdened to make their monthly mortgage payments. And Can we just, our could mm -hmm. we pause for a second just to see, or just to invite people if they have a question that you want to ask or a comment about anything, you can, again, you can raise your hand and, and just um, talk with us and ask that question or make a comment or um, to type those in, just, that was a lot of information to take in. But. Yeah, April, that was a lot of math. And if we have to go back <laughs> on anything, we definitely can. Um, yeah. So if you have questions to chat in, we can go back on something if we have to. Uh, the next topic that we will discuss is uh, the Family Selection Committee and uh, any improvements you can make there. It might be so that it's we... crystal clear to everybody, or if you've done something similar at your affiliate that you'd like to share with us, I just wanted to pause for a moment and give you a chance to share that. But I'll. I'll interrupt you if, if something comes in, okay? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, in the interest of time, we'll move into the Family Selection Committee uh, information here. So the committee is also a very important part of your qualification process. You need to ensure that they you have the right people for the job, the right guidelines in place for them to use, the proper documentation and re resources for them. And uh, looking at your family selection committee's best practices is a great way to ensure a consistent and accurate review of applications, uh, which at our affiliate has even helped us to find more qualified applicants just by the processes and policies that we've utilized there. So one of the first things we look at is uh, the, the meeting practices. What are we doing each month at our committee meetings? Uh, one of the things that we've done at our affiliate is to ensure that the work for each application, each file is done up front. And as we discussed before, that the verifications are done beforehand and that the credit report is done beforehand. So doing this ensures that the uh, committee has all the correct information go off of right away and you're not going to deny applicants based upon incomplete information. So I'll show you here our uh, verification of employment. These are just simple forms that we send out to employers. Here we have the employers and on the right we have verification of public assistance. So both of these, like I said, are just sent out beforehand to get all of that correct information right away. And like I said before, another way to do this is to require pay stubs or statements. So another thing we look at would be at each meeting we utilize what I call the applicant qualification calculator. And it looks like in the interest of time we'll just take a quick glance at this and if you have more questions or want to utilize it, uh, contact us afterward. So here you see uh, just a, a snippet of what I use for the applicant qualification calculator. So we have John and Jane here and we fill out their information and we can see up here that they don't actually make the housing ratio. They would be cost burdened by their housing payment. We see them at 36.59%. And you can see that this is the information from their application. 
Um, so just look around at some of the details there. The uh, full sheet has a lot more details, but just a, a quick snippet of this for you, what we utilize. But as I talked about earlier, after we verify income, we might find that they didn't actually list the correct amount, and uh, verifying the income can really help. So additional notes that we verified income yesterday, and we found that uh, John actually makes $1,800 a month instead of $1,400, which actually just qualifies them. Uh, we've now seen this turn to green, and meaning green for go, we're under 30%, so that's good. Uh, back to our meeting practices again, another thing we utilize is the meeting process sheet uh, that helps us to ensure a consistent review, as well as the committee checklist. So here we see both of those, the meeting process. Uh, this is just how we go over each file each time. We don't have to pass the files around. There's more anonymity this way. We don't have to read the applicant's entire information or address. We just go over the information that is pertinent to qualifying them. It helps us in a small town not have all that information out and any biased decisions in that way. It also helps us to give a consistent and fair review to all applicants. A committee checklist helps us going forward in each meeting knowing where applicants qualify, uh, what they're still missing, any other problems that we might see. And the biggest thing on here is to know in each meeting that we basically have to have a decision. Uh, do we have a few more questions or further inquiries required? Uh, should this applicant just be denied due to not meeting any of these criteria? Or is it time to move to a home visit? And after that home visit is complete, is a time to recommend to the, them to the board. So knowing at every meeting a decision has to be made has been very helpful, as well as we don't have a family services staff, so who's going to handle what needs to be done? There's a name spot for each one of them. Um, another thing that we have for the committee, this would be uh, to go to the board and recommend applicants. So just having a nice sheet, this is a simple Excel document that I'm showing to you as a, a PDF here, but uh, we bring this to the board and present information anonymously and just present everything, once again, that's pertinent to qualifying an applicant. So it's just a simple way to have all that information and for the board to see that in a um, respected manner. So just knowing everything about the file is and presenting it in a professional fashion is going to help you approve them at the board level uh, as we've seen, as I've seen at my affiliate a few times, um, just getting past that barrier of the board having questions. Uh, another thing you need to have in place at your affiliate, and especially for your committee, is to have effective policies and procedures. Just pictured here is the first of about seven pages of our family selection criteria policy. I've completely revised and uh, made this more effective for our affiliate, made some changes in that. So making your committee knowledgeable about your policies as well as having everything written out for them helps them to make more effective decisions. And another thing we can look at is the committee structure. Uh, here we have what I've newly implemented at our affiliate. A few new positions on here as well. So I'll go over them. Uh, the chair simply presides over each meeting and make sure that all the other positions are doing what they need to do. Uh, we also have the vice chair that will fill in in that capacity, as well as training any new members. Uh, the secretary has the role of taking the minutes, of course, and keeping us organized going forward from meeting to meeting. The board liaison is going to bring our information from each meeting to the board, as well as recommend applicants to the board. Uh, the staff liaison is going to be the person that comes into the staff, lets them know what's going on with the committee, as well as filling in those verifications, sending those out, and getting all the information we need for the application beforehand. The information officer is simply the person that handles those qualification calculators going forward, reading the credit reports and everything, and if you're interested in further descriptions of all of these, I have them written out as well. And one of the last things we can look at is in our committee is to make sure that we have uh, the members have skills and professions pertinent to selecting families. 
So we want to make sure you know that we have some people that are good with numbers and can make these calculations. We want to have people that are uh, comfortable and going to make the families comfortable. You know, have experience with with poverty. Uh, we want to have people that know the laws and policies out there that help us each meeting, just knowing things that are going on and uh, having faith-based people really helps us keep true to our mission as well as gives us great connections to the community. And who you have on your committee uh, can also help with outreach uh, and finding potential partner families and more diverse occupationally, racially, or ethnically. If you have a diverse uh, population in your service area, the more potential organizations you can reach out to and uh, network with. So we want to open it up to any questions. We can go back to slides. Uh, review things again and just let you know that you have the opportunity to contact us at any time to go over any of this information in more detail as well as the fact that we only had an hour here and there's uh, a ton of more information that we've that we could give you to so April hi thank you you guys are awesome um, I've been pleading with everyone to get some uh, questions or comments or just to answer the question of will they use any of these strategies or what they think would be most useful. Um, but it's pretty quiet here so far. Um, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, we'll be able to send out all of these resources and you'll get a link to the slides and to the recording um, and all of these documents that Zach has created, he's happy to share with everybody. So. Um, that would be great. Um, all right, so one of the questions was, <laughs> this is probably pretty, uh, this might explain a lot. So Tina in Steel with Zika, she's a new um, family services uh, and volunteer coordinator there, but she says she might have questions, but we'll need to look over the slides first. <laughs> so um, I'll include, we'll include Aaron and Zach's contact information as well in the follow-up email so I know that um, they are both happy to field your questions and, and answer that. Um, by the way, Zach Laurie, the executive director at Douglas County adds great job and, and just you know they're using the strategies. I know she's delighted with her Vista. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> so I'm actually going to unmute. I know that Sarah, we've got a couple Habitat staff here who are participating. So I'm going to unmute and Sarah wanted to add something as well. Hi, everyone. This is Sarah at Habitat Minnesota. Um, Molly and I have been listening in as well and um, are very excited that to learn more about this topic, but also, you know, to showcase the fantastic work that um, Zach and Erin have been doing in this area. Um, and I just wanted to put in a little plug um, for the VISTA program. And, you know, um, I think what Zach and Erin have done are great examples of, of what VISTAs can do for affiliates. Um, you know, if this is an area that your affiliate is wanting to do some work on and you're wondering how you're ever going to find the time to do it, um, a VISTA might be a great resource for you to do this kind of work. So, you know, please get in touch with April or myself um, if you'd like to talk with us and explore what, you know, how to access a VISTA um, to support your affiliate in doing some work around uh, family selection and family support. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. That's a, a great point. I mean, looking at our affiliate, everything that I've been working on has been to ensure, you know, we use that phrase with Vista all the time, capacity building. It's been to ensure that we've been building capacity. Everything that I'm doing, I um, want to make sure that it's not just a short-term fix. You know, I've been working with the committee to make sure that these things continue, and everything that I've done has been you know, put it in files and, and made sure that that documentation will be used going forward uh, to improve that process. And, you know, just the simplest fact that we have three out of four families approved for next year is a great testament to what a VISA can do for an affiliate, I guess. Great. Uh, well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions, so there's no harm in ending a few minutes early. Um, I did send, I just posted Aaron and uh, Zach's email addresses, but again, we'll include that in the follow-up information. So I think Tina may have nailed it, that there's some digesting of all of this information, and then uh, there may be questions 
later. So thank you so much for joining us today. We had such a good turnout. Um, so many of you uh, were there, uh, were with us today. It was really great. So I'm going to sign off and just say thank you again. Zach and Aaron put so much work into this. It was just awesome. Thanks so much.